Being trapped in a ship far under the surface of the ocean would be a terrifying thought to someone with a deep, pun not intended, dread of the ocean. This was the fate of the crew of a Soviet submarine in 2000. Tonight I will be discussing one of the most tragic underwater ocean accidents to happen in recent memory. This is the story of the RS Kursk. The sinking of the Russian submarine Kursk was one of the worst peacetime submarine accidents in history. The sinking of the vessel occurred during a military exercise in the Barents Sea, and all the ship's 118 sailors were killed in the accident. The K-141, or Kursk, was the anti-class submarine that was completed inside to the North Russian fleet in 1994. Anti-class subs like the Kursk were nicknamed Oscar II by NATO forces. These submarines were manufactured with the intent of hunting and killing large enemy ships, such as aircraft carriers. The Oscar IIs were nuclear-powered submarines that were approximately 508 feet long, quite large for a submarine. Each submarine carried 24 granite missiles tipped with 500 kiloton warheads, capable of completely neutralizing enemy aircraft carriers, and a Legenda-class satellite system to track their targets. The Kursk disaster occurred in August 12, 2000. The Kursk was engaged in a fleet training scenario in the Barents Sea with the aircraft carrier Admiral Kuzenskov and the battle cruiser Peter Veliki, or Peter the Great. The Kursk was fully armed with granite missiles and torpedoes, and was in the process of making a simulated attack on the Peter the Great. At 11.20 local time, while the Kursk was engaged in training, a Type 65-76A heavy torpedo in the ship's forward torpedo room exploded and ripped a hole in the side of the nuclear-powered vessel. This was due to a faulty weld that failed to hold the hydrogen peroxide chamber and the torpedo together. The shock from this blast registered 4.2 on the Richter scale and was so powerful that seismograph stations as far away as Alaska detected the explosion of the cursed torpedo room. Russian accounts recorded that the 28,000-ton battlecruiser Peter the Great visibly shook from the explosion. The initial shock from the blast in the forward torpedo room was followed by another massive explosion that drove the sub submarine to the bottom of the sea at a depth of 108 meters, where the submarine finally settled. The twin explosions killed a majority of the crew instantly, leaving just 23 surviving sailors aboard the vessel. The reaction between the torpedo fuel and the explosion caused a devastating fire that rose up to 48,000 degrees. The fire began to sweep up the ship, burning almost everything in its path. The survivors in the five rear compartments broke protocol and abandoned their posts, making their way to the ninth compartment at the stern of the submarine, where the exit hatch was located. The Russian Northern Fleet Command, after losing contact with the Kursk, failed to realize what happened to the submarine failing to call a state of emergency and sound the alarm until 11 hours after the accident. While the fleet command struggled to respond, the remaining crew had passed away. From asphyxiation after a crew member dropped an oxygen cartridge while in the process of changing a filter, the cartridge fell into the oily water that was rising in the compartment, catching fire and combusting in the close quarters of the ninth compartment. The resulting explosion killed many of the sailors and ate up much of the oxygen in the compartment. Despite their best efforts to survive, by the sixth hour after the sinking of the Kursk, the crew had completely run out of oxygen, and all the men had died of asphyxiation soon after. Five hours after calling a state of emergency, and 16 hours after the incident, the Russian Navy deployed search parties in the rescue ship Mikhail Rudinsky, well after the crew had died. On land, the Russian media continued to spread false information released by the Russian military. Rumors that the Kursk had been sucked by a U.S. submarine and struck a World War II mine abounded, and the Kremlin stated that the incident was a minor malfunction and that the sailors were safe. Putin was not informed by the commander of the Northern Fleet until the morning after the incident and was away on a vacation during the initial rescue operations. Foreign governments became aware of the submarine sinking not long after the initial explosions in the submarine's forward torpedo room. Once informed, American and British governments, along with several other countries, extended offers to help with rescuing the sailors. The Russian government refused any offers for help, telling the respective foreign embassies that a rescue was underway. The rescue ship Mikhail Rudensky arrived at the location. While setting anchor, its crew interpreted acoustic sound as an SOS from the submarine, 
but soon concluded the noise had been produced by the anchor chain striking the anchor hole. The submersible AS-34 was lowered into the water shortly after. While at a depth of roughly 100 meters, the baby submersible collided with an object. The crew of the submersible spotted the cursed propeller and stern stabilizer. The AS-34 then returned to the surface for repairs. At 2240, the sister submersible, the AS-34, the AS-32, entered the water and began searching for Kursk. It was unable to locate the submarine as it had been given an incorrect heading by personnel aboard the Peter the Great. The S-32 then quit its search and headed back to its mothership. The S-34 was repaired and then launched at 5 o'clock on Monday. At 6.50, it was able to locate the Kursk, unsuccessfully tried to attach the aft escape trunk over Kursk's 9th compartment. Unable to create the vacuum seal necessary to attach the escape trunk, its batteries quickly depleted and the crew was forced to surface. No spare batteries were available, so the crew was forced to wait while the batteries were recharged. Bad weather caused multiple delays throughout Tuesday and Wednesday. A diving bell was lowered into the water Wednesday, but was unable to connect successfully to the sunken submarine. Another rescue ship arrived on the scene Thursday with a newer model submersible equipped with a recompression system. The rescuers were once again struck by bad luck as the submersible was unable to latch onto the Kursk's rescue hatch. Meanwhile, the Russian media began to openly criticize the Navy's unwillingness to accept help from the international community. Five days after the incident, Putin accepted the British and Norwegian offers for assistance. By Friday, day six, multiple teams of Norwegian and British divers arrived in Russia, followed by a British rescue submersible and the Norwegian ship, the Norman Pioneer, on sa- Saturday. A remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, was lowered to the Kursk. Footage revealed that all that was left to the front of the ship was a mass of twisted debris and metal. The divers made their way down the length of the Kursk to the ninth compartment hatch. The divers tried to use the arms of the ROV to pry open the hatch, but were unsuccessful until Monday morning. After entering the interior, the divers found the rescue trunk full of water. They then used a custom tool to open the inter- internal hatch on the rescue trunk. The rescuers lowered a video camera on a rod into the compartment. The video feed showed only dead bodies. The Norwegian salvage company then made agreement with the Russian government. The Norwegian divers would cut a hole into the hole to grant access to the Russian divers thus making sure that no sensitive military information was taken from the ship by the English or the Norwegians. The Russian diving team on the scene then entered the side of the ship and made their way to the subcompartment. The divers opened the bulkhead, finding the compartment full of floating dust and ash, which severely reduced visibility for the team. They then worked their way down two levels, encountering the body of the man who had been in command of the sailors, Captain Dmitry Kolenskinov. Captain Kolenskinov and the other dead dead men's bodies were covered in burns from the fire that killed many of them. The divers cut additional holes in the hole over the third and fourth compartments. The Russian divers eventually recovered a total of 12 bodies from the ninth compartment. Meanwhile, the ship's log was recovered and the wreckage scanned for radiation. Fortunately, only low levels of radiation were present at the site, meaning that the reactor had successfully shut off. After the divers confirmed that no one was alive in the ninth compartment, the chief of staff of the Russian Northern Fleet announced to the public that the Kursk had flooded and all of its crew members had died. The contradicting information immediately triggered a massive amount of backlash from the public. Admiral Popov, commander of the Northern Fleet, also addressed the public in a televised broadcast and asked the Kursk family members for forgiveness, apologizing for not bringing the sailors back. August 23, 2000, was declared a day of mourning by Russia. The title of Hero of Russia was awarded posthumously to the submarine's commander, Grenadine Lutlyakin, and the 117 crew members and specialists were posthumously awarded the Order of Courage. Information about the Kursk incident was withheld from the families of the sailors after the events of the attempted rescue. Many of the deceased crew members' families only heard about the accident through rumors at the naval station or through foreign media outlets. Lists of the missing sailors were kept from relatives and family members, and the Russian government went out of its way to prohibit reporters from contacting the families. 
The fake information, the evident problems that the Russian government had in the attempted rescues, turned public opinion against the military bureaucracy and the new ruler, Putin. On the 22nd of August, 10 days after the sinking, Putin met with grieving family members in a closed meeting. Distraught widows and mothers cried out, asking why they were receiving so much conflicting information and demanding to know who was going to be punished for the deaths of their loved ones. The meeting went on for three hours, with the interaction between the officials and the civilians deteriorating throughout the course of the meeting. At one point, a mother of one of the sailors got up and yelled at the government members present, You better shoot yourselves now. We won't let you live, bastards. After this statement, the security officer came behind the woman and forcibly sedated her. The mother was then carried out. Videos shown to the public afterwards were heavily edited, with the emotional interaction between Putin and the family member removed completely. However, news of the sedation quickly spread abroad. Observers in the West grew worried that this event showed that Russia was starting to return to the Soviet-era methods of silencing people. The Russian authorities released a statement that the sedation was for the protection of the mother and the civilians around her, but this statement fooled few people. After the public relations catastrophe that was the conference, the Russian authorities actually did do something that ended up benefiting the orphaned and widowed families. The families were given 10 years worth of salaries, free resettlement and housing in the Russian city of their choice, free college education for their children, and free counseling. Charitable donations from around the world also poured in to help the families. Overall, the bitterness of the event still cast a shadow on the families that monetary help could not fill. The Russian government bungled almost every part of their operation to recover the Kursk. The accident was caused by corruption that was inherent in post-Soviet Russia. The explosion of the torpedo was caused by poor workmanship, as hydrogen peroxide leaked from cracks in the casing of the weapon. The resulting explosion of the fuel leaking from the test torpedo resulted in a chain reaction in the torpedo room. The reason these antiquated and immensely dangerous torpedoes were even in the submarine in the first place was because the Russian government's desire to cut costs went wherever they could. The seals of the torpedoes were known to be faulty during inspections leading up to the exercise, but the reports about leaking seals were ignored by the naval command. The Kursk was also equipped with a rescue capsule in the conning tower and a rescue trunk, but the explosion rendered the use of the escape vessel useless, and the fire destroyed the rescue trunk in the fifth compartment. The rescue buoy that was designed to show rescue crews location of the submarine also failed to deploy, making the search much harder for teams. The failing safety system screwed over the surviving sailors. What really killed the men of the Kursk was the corruption and lethargy of the, Ru of the Russian government. The military looked to make as many shortcuts as possible to the construction and maintenance of the Kursk. The Navy command had actively implemented safety regulations gone through the process of inspections, the Kursk would likely have not had a major catastrophe like it did in August of 2000. The story of the sinking of the Kursk and the death of its crew is not only a tragedy, it is an example of what happens when a corrupt government fails to take care of its sailors and their families. And that is it. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching all the way through the video. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. Thank you, and good night.